I'm going to read from Genesis chapter 10, selected verses from Genesis chapter 10. This is the account of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, Noah's sons, who themselves had sons after the flood. The sons of Japheth, Goma, Magog, Madai, Javan, Jabal, Meshach, and Tyrus. The sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. Cush was the father of Nimrod, who became a mighty warrior on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. That is why it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The first centers of his kingdom were Babylon, Uruk, Akkad, and Kalna in Shinar. From that land he went to Assyria, where he built Nineveh, Reba, Rehoboth, Aya, Kala, and Rezan, which is between Nineveh and Kala, which is a great city. Verse 21. Sons were also born to Shem, whose older brother was Japheth. Shem was the ancestor of all the sons of Eber. The sons of Shem, Elam, Asher, Arphaxed, Lud, and Aram. Verse 25. Two sons were born to Eber. One was named Peleg because his time on earth was divided. His brother was named Jotan. Uh, many of you have noticed uh, recently, uh, Stephen Hawkins, you'll remember he had passed away this last year. And um, uh, an amazing, has an amazing life, an amazing man. And he was buried with royalty, literally. He was buried with royalty, which is to say uh, the kings and the queens of this country. He's buried in the same spot as they were. Uh, and also some very, very famous names like Isaac Newton and Charles Dickens. Okay, so he was buried in the, does everybody, anybody know? Where is Minister Abbey? That's where everybody wants to be buried. If, if you have to be buried, if you have to die, that's where you want to be buried, yeah? And that's where he was um, uh, interned. Well, that's very interesting. Uh, the Western Minister Abbey is a, is a church, uh, and yet we know that Stephen Hawking did not, at least later in life, did not believe in God. We know that for certain. And so we ask the question, why was he buried there? I assume there must be some sort of church person who has to pass their approval on who is going to be buried in that church. And I suppose that this is the way that the church is saying to the world, it really doesn't matter what you believe. It doesn't matter your faith, if you're successful, if you contribute good ideas to society, if you're famous enough, we'll put you there and you'll go down for all eternity as a success in the eyes of the world. I assume that that must be the statement that the church is making. And, and that's very pragmatic, don't you think? That at the end of the day, what people are saying is it really doesn't matter what one believes. It doesn't matter what faith one has. You know, all you really need to do is just be famous and successful and, you know, make a name for yourself and you will go down well and you will be buried in a church, even though you wrote a book right towards the end of your life in which you spent time saying God does not exist and I don't believe in him. So what does the Bible say? Now, returning to Genesis, we're looking at our second genealogical list. And a lot of people get very bored when you get to the genealogical list. And I, and I understand. It's a lot of names that are foreign to us. Okay. These are not Saxon names. They're weird. Yeah. Um, and what's the, what's the purpose of all this? We remember that that first genealogical list, when we looked at it, we had two groups of people. We had the Sethites and the uh, Canaanites, right? And the Sethites were the, the, the people through whom uh, God delivered humanity through the flood, and they had faith. And then you had the Canaanites 
and we saw that things were just getting worse and worse and worse until um, one day uh, they, they just ceased to be a, a group of people. And it was a, a very shocking uh, moment, even though they looked extremely well to do and they looked like they had done so many good things. And, and a lot of those similar themes are going to come up today with the children of Noah, okay? So the, the thing that God says to Noah, but to specifically, you can see him looking down at the three kids. He says, you guys be fruitful, multiply, and I want you to go now. Go, leave, and fill this earth, okay? Get out of your boat, get away from each other, go and find your land. And that's precisely what happens. Every single child goes out, they have multiple children, all the children they have, they're wildly successful. They find their own little inhabited spot. They do well. They set up their own nations. We'll get to see more about who those nations are in a few minutes here. They're wildly successful. But that doesn't mean that all is well. That, that success doesn't mean that all is well with God. There might be a further blessing that can be missed out. Just like grass is beautiful for a moment, just like flowers are beautiful for a moment. Yeah, enjoy that, but that's a gift from God. And maybe he wants more. Maybe he wants something eternal for us. So here's what I have down for our idea that I want us to be thinking about this morning. Everyone gets grace in place. Everyone gets momentary grace in place. But only those with faith get a blessing. Everyone gets grace in place. But only those with faith, the whole, and what it tells us, and what it tells us. And I think that we're going to see some interesting patterns here. So uh, first off, um, I really feel terrible for everyone who uh, is online because everyone here is going to pass around this paper and it's going to show a lot of what I'm about to explain. But I don't know if I'll manage to be able to get it up online. It's a little bit technical to try to put that together. We'll see if I'm able to do it or not. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, so we have three sons of Noah. We're just going to talk through what is on this list. So the three sons are Yafet, Ham, and Shem, okay? And they spread out into all the world. Now, some say that this is just an elaborate fairy tale. So someone's going to say, oh, that's hilarious. There are not three people through whom we get all our genetics. Let's just be honest. That's not true. But actually, um, outside of Christianity, uh, secular scientists generally agree that all of human genetics can be derived from one of three sources. They don't make that out to be a person per se, but they, they very well come out and say three people contribute to all the genetics in the world. You have three sources for your genes that we will see in the world. So they would, they would actually agree with this idea. They just would disagree with the notion that it's these particular people. Um, so there you are. Uh, Yafet has seven children. And we're told about their children's children. So Yafet and his children's children. If you're wondering who Yafet are, most of you here are Yafet, okay? <laughs> Yafet is Europe, okay? Uh, Yafet is uh, going to spread out through the Mediterranean and then go up to here, okay? Uh, and then out towards Russia and uh, is going to contribute to some of the genetics that will end up in the Americas. That's going to be mixed with some ham genetics. This is what it looks like, okay? So there you are. Uh, ham has got four children here. Uh, and that's going to be the, the Middle East is what you can think of as most of, of, of Ham's domain is going to be what, what is uh, effectively the Middle East at this point. And then also spreading out towards Asia and a little bit into the Americas um, through that corner there. And then we have Shem, and he has five children, and their children are described. And he's just kind of dispersed among everything, really. He doesn't have an actual you know, huge domain like the others do. He's, he's dispersed, which that picture kind of deceives with the giant yellow. Most of that is desert, just so everybody knows. <laughs> um, but he, he's just dispersed among, uh, uh, among Ham. He looks the least successful of all of the children. And, oh, and you can uh, pass those uh, uh, if, you, if you would to, to each other after you've seen it. Uh, so everybody can see the, 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 the map for those of you who have the map in front of you. I only, I only did three copies. Um, so the, the, the person that looks the, 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 the least successful is actually the one that God deems the most important. And therein starts to, to be this kind of weird world in which God operates, in which things that appear to be so 
the, the normal way that we view life, God flips it around and says, that's wrong. It's not those that look most successful. It's not those who get their name in the book. It's not those who, who manage to go out and grab life by the horns and make people notice and make a name for themselves. God says that's not necessarily what ultimately will have value at the end. It flips how we're going to look at the world. Because most of you, and myself included, at the end of the day, our view of what would be great is for people to think well of us and to have a name for ourselves. But God says, not necessarily. There might be a different blessing. Appearance can be deceiving. Now, the point of this genealogy is it's for the Israelites, and we'll get back to that in a second. But it's also, basically, God has uh, given the names of every place they know about and said, here are the people that are dwelling there. So if you were a person in the ancient world, you knew the places that were being spoken about. There might be places that you were unfamiliar with, but most of these places would have been in a map in your head of places that you could potentially visit maybe someday. And you would know, oh, th those are the people. They're the children of Ham. Oh, those are the people. They're the ch children of Japheth. And so this map kind of fills in the big blank of the, the, the world that you knew. Everyone in the world that you knew is explained. Now, it doesn't explain stuff outside of the Middle East, okay? And there is stuff going on outside of the Middle East. It just has that big picture of everything that they knew in their civilized world. And uh, we know that civilization essentially starts right in the middle there uh, in uh, Sumer, okay, which is going to be in Mesopotamia, right in the middle. It's directly below, directly below the Ararat Mountains. We know that's where civilization be begins, okay? And so this is a, a description of the known world for them. But what I want to, to indicate is that the picture is, is that God has penciled in each child of Noah and each grandchild and given them a place and given them space and given them provision. That's what's happened. It's, all, it's almost like God is just like sitting there now, what am I going to give my children? Okay, yeah, fact. he's going to get, and he read something in. Mm, what about his six kids? They get, and he just, you can see him marking the map. They'll go here, 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 here. He's giving each person something. Now, some people may get something that is wildly better than what other people get, but there, no, nobody is getting nothing. And it's this idea of measured grace. God has a provision for everyone, and God has a provision for you. Before you were born, before anything happened in your life, God imagined a space for you to dwell. God imagined the provision that you would need. God imagined all the things that you would do and everywhere you would go. Have you ever been to a park and you thought, this is amazing? God did that. He planned for you to go to the park. I, I remember um, I, I lived in the mountains in uh, Colorado. Uh, you can look up where that is, kind of in the middle of America. And um, I would walk from my house up into my parents' house. And as I would walk, I would just get caught in the beauty of it all, these rolling uh, mountains and we had grass, really high grass and the wind would blow through the grass and there was these wonderful trees. Uh, it's a bit like Switzerland if you guys are wondering what it was like. Um, really gorgeous and I walk up to my house and I would think this is for me and that's right actually. I created this world and in part here's my gift to you. A space and a place and measured grace. God has given gifts to all mankind. And that's what we see before us. Now, I just want to point out one more thing about this gift, which is this gift is irrespective of what people do. So God is giving grace to all sorts of people. You'll notice that God gives grace to the Hamites here. He gives them the largest amount of territory, really. And they seem to be the most successful. But Ham is the one who does the bad thing in the previous chapter. If you go back and look at that sermon, you'll see what Ham does and uh, Noah says, actually, the children of Ham are going to have your behavior, Ham, inside of them, and it's not going to go well. And I can see kind of a little bit of the future. It's going to go badly. But you know what? I don't see God saying, well, that's it. You get a little tiny island. That's it. That's all you're getting. God gives uh, this grace out, and it's, it's not proportionate to what we deserve. He just gives it. And therein lies the problem. The problem is that God gives this grace out and he gives success out and Ham looks the most successful here. But um, 
but Ham may still not be right with the Lord. But Ham will be tempted to think he's right with the Lord because things have gone well. So we'll get into that a little bit. That's the first idea. God blesses all with provision and grace and place, but we need to not be deceived because having momentary grace in place doesn't mean we're ultimately getting the blessing, being right with him. And we see that because it turns out that the person who does the best, who is the most successful in this story, is God's least favorite person. (laughs) And he tells us, this is my least favorite person. So look with me at verse 8. Let's take a look at verse 8. And this is chapter 10. Cush was the father of Nimrod, who became a mighty warrior on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. That is why it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The verse center of his kingdom was Babylon, Uruk, Akkad, Kalnate, and Shinar. From that land, he went to Assyria, and there he built Nivna, Raboth, Kalah, and Rosen, which is between Nineveh and Kalah, which is the great city. So we're told about this guy, Nimrod, and man, he has like just, they've just named the major cities of Mesopotamia. That's his heritage. His heritage is he built all of these huge cities, and we're talking about 2,000 miles of distance. This guy built some cities. He is famous. Actually, we know exactly who it is. I'll talk about that in a moment. But um, (laughs) when you look over at somebody and you're upset with them, and let's say you're really upset and you say, you Nimrod, usually you're not saying something nice at that point. (laughs) The word Nimrod usually means like, you know, moron. You, you, Nimrod, and, and this is not without reason. This is where the word comes from. And the word in Hebrew means to rebel, and it means a tyrant. It means to rebel, and it means a, a tyrant. And, and so this man is a man who is a rebel, a rebel against two. Well, literally in history, we know that, um, you know, God said to go out and find your space and find your country. This man didn't go out and find anything. He said, well, here's a city. And then through subterfuge and through murder and through intrigue, he took over. And then he's like, I'm going to build an army. And I'm going to march around Mesopotamia and kill whoever stands in my way. And I'm going to make a great, big, mighty name for myself. I am a mighty man. And so he went and had his wars. And he went and had his building projects. And he is the first dictator in history. And uh, all of the archetypes that we think of, like we think of Stalin, we can think of other terrible people in history who made a name for themselves. They did great things, quote unquote, uh, but their bottom line was them. All of these people go back to this archetype that we have in Nimrod. And it's brazen rebellion against the Lord. Remember the Lord's command? The one who takes the blood of man from that man, the the blood will be required. Do not murder men, God said. And he also said, by the way, animals, treat them nicely. Don't don't abuse the animals. You know, you're going to eat them, but be nice and pour their blood out because it's a sacred thing. They're giving their life for you. Remember that? Nimrod's like, man, I love hunting. And I don't really care whether it's man or whether it's animal. I just like taking life. That's Nimrod for you. And that's in comparison with what the Bible talks about. It talks about a king. A good king is a shepherd. They're looking after the sheep. They're caring for the sheep. Nimrod, I'll kill whatever comes in my way. And I like killing. This is a wicked, wicked man. And God is saying, I am not pleased. In fact, when it says he was a mighty warrior before the Lord, uh, you could translate. He was a mighty warrior uh, raging against God. He raged against God. But um, if Nimrod was buried today, if he grew up here in the UK, do you know where he'd be buried? Westminster Abbey. That's right. That's where Nimrod would be buried. And perhaps right now we would be rethinking whether that was a good decision. Yeah? Because we're having a time of thoughtful recourse about people's behaviors. And that is a really powerful thing to look and say, well, maybe someone's accomplishments are not the whole picture. Maybe their moral character matters. That's really good but he would be buried there today. And God tells us, I am entirely displeased with all of this. And he is successful in the world's eye, but he is abominable in my eyes. 
And that flips things around, doesn't it? It turns our view of things totally upside down. By the way, the guy's name is Sargon the Great. That's who it actually is. Sargon the Great or Sargon of Akkad. He was the first empire builder. He came upon the Sumerians and he was so crafty and he got in charge and he just ran with it. And we'll find out what God does with Sargon in the next chapter. But if you were to walk up to someone who is not a believer and say to them, hey, listen, there's good news. Jesus has died for your sins. He wants you to be right with him and you can accept that and you can change your life. So often what people say is what? I'm already successful. I'm already good. I mean, God must be happy with me. Well, just because things have gone well doesn't mean that God's happy with you. Just because life has gone smoothly, it's gone swimmingly, doesn't mean that God is happy with you. You could be Nimrod. There is a bigger blessing. There is a further blessing. Don't miss out. So God gives everyone some grace and space, but don't just be, be deceived. We need more. Only those with faith will receive the blessing. And so lastly this morning, we see that the faithful endure, whereas the momentary blessings of grace and, and space, they run out. They're, they're like grass that and, and then turns brown. That's, that's what God does with our lives. There's a moment of green that is given from him. But that moment is to lead to something. So we're going to see this in those who God eventually turns away from and then those who God turns towards. So uh, let's start in verse 15. Canaan was the father of Sidon, his firstborn, and of the Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites, Girgashites, Hivites, Archites, Sinites, Arvids, Zemrites, and Hamites. Later, the Canaanite clans were scattered, and the borders of Canaan reached from Sidon towards Gerar, as far as Gaza, and then towards Sodom and Gomorrah, Adam, and Zeboim, as far as Lasha. As far as Lasha. So we have the description of Canaan. We'll remember of Canaan. We remember of him that that was the son that Noah said something is going to go wrong with that kid. He's going to be like you, Ham, in your kind of what you did perversely. He, that's going to characterize your son, Canaan. Well, guess what? Canaan does exceedingly well. Look at all those children going to all those different places. He occupies what is today Israel. So he does exceptionally well, yeah? Uh, but then at the end of this description, it says, oh, just so you know, here's the dimensions of Canaan's land. It goes from such and such to such and such and such and such to such and such. You'll notice he doesn't do that with the Yaphites. What's that about? Um, <laughs> The answer is the people reading this are the Israelites and they're being told the land that they're about to get to possess. Here's the land of Canaan. It goes from here to here and here to here. And by the way, these people are faithless. Now, that doesn't sound fair. Well, we have to remember that they had about 900 years of God giving this grace. Here's a beautiful place. Here's beautiful land. Inhabit it, enjoy it, and respond to me and yet that response is not there for 900 years. And so after 900 years, God says, I'll take your land and I'll give it to somebody who's willing to have faith. I'll take the gift that I gave you that you were unworthy of, and I will give it to someone else. And the someone else is the Israelites. Okay. The someone else is the Israelites. And so it gives us this principle about God's amazing provision. It's an invitation to respond to him. God's provision in your life is an invitation to respond to the Lord. A, a, an invitation to respond to the giver. Have you ever been given a present and you have had no response whatsoever? You don't even recognize the giver. This is the danger of getting something in the mail and not being sure who gave it to you. But if you know who gave it to you, okay, the Amazon person doesn't tell you, but you find out who gave you the present, how terrible it would be to not respond to the giver and to not thank them. And that's what we have here with the Canaanites. And so God's provision eventually runs out. And the word here is scattered. It says they were scattered. 
And that word is a word that God uses for wickedness. There's wicked people. They join together. They're doing wicked things. They don't repent. God says, I'm going to break you guys up to go to your little spots so that maybe individually some of you will turn from the course that you're on. So together you're annoying, but apart, maybe I'll get to your hearts. And so he scatters the Canaanites with the hope of giving them individually grace, with the hope of getting grace. And we'll see that later in the book, okay? So now look at this, uh, verse 25. We're going to see another group is scattered. Two sons were born to Ever. One was named Peleg because in his time, the earth was divided. And his brother's name was Yachtan, which just means younger, by the way, younger. So apparently he ran out of names and just said, you're the younger one. Um, <laughs> Yachtan does. Anyway, so we have this gentleman named Pegleg. And why was he named Pegleg? Because during his life, it says, the earth was divided. And that makes us wonder, well, what happened that it divided? More on that next week. But here's what actually happened. Those sons of Ham, and the most famous of the sons of Ham is the gentleman that I just mentioned, Nimrod, Sargon the Great. Those sons of Ham, they all decide to stay put and kind of rebel against God together. <laughs> yeah, we are not trusting you. And we're going to find out in the next chapter that they build a tower just in case God tries to flood the world again. We're going to have a nice big tower. You won't be able to do it, God. <laughs> okay? We're staying in where we are. We're not going to the far corners. We're not cutting out a space for ourselves. And God is going to come in and just divide them. He's going to send them away so that he can reach them individually, perhaps. And this is what God does. And it's reflected in this man's name, Peleg. God scatters them. That provision that he gave them is meant to lead to repentance. And so that land that they had occupied is going to go to other people in the long run. Now, I want you to think about the New Testament. Is this just a terrible Old Testament paradigm that's going on? And isn't it good that God is gracious now, but he wasn't gracious in the past? No. Jesus has this story about the talents. Do we remember the story? In the story of the talents, God gives out different provisions. Remember, some get more, some get less, but everybody gets something. And one of those people says, oh, my master is cruel and unkind. Your master just gave you money. He says, my master is cruel and unkind. He takes the money and he has to pay somebody to bury that pile of money somewhere. And then when his master comes by, he has to pay someone to dig it all up. And then he goes, here's your money. <laughs> and then the master says, in disgust, he's like, take that money and give it to the guy who knows how to invest my money. <laughs> give him that money. And it's this picture of being given life, being given grace, being given talents, being given a place, being given that momentary, wonderful gift from God and, and not responding it and saying, I'm not going to look at you. I'm not going to think about you. I'm burying my gifts. You can't have any of it. And then God says, eventually, well, I'm taking it away and giving it to somebody who can use it. This is the way he sums it up. Matthew uh, 13, 12. Whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. Even what they have will be taken from them. And so your gift is also an obligation to respond. Your gift is, awful, awful, awful. Your gift is also an obligation to say to God, thank you. And, and I want to acknowledge you, and I want to see you, and I want to live by faith. Now look at this. Uh, this is what we're told about the, 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 the sons of Shem, that they received the bigger blessing. So we see this in verse uh, 21. This is the last little section. It says, the sons of Shem were Elam, Asher, Arkad, Lud, and Aram. The sons of Shem were Elam, Asher, Arkad. Oh, I'm sorry. The verse above. Sons were born to Shem, whose elder brother was Yaphet. Shem was the ancestor of all the sons of Eber. That's what I meant to share. I apologize. So uh, Shem's line is given last out of these three lines. So the first two were Ham and Yafet. Yeah, Yafet and then Ham is what it was. And then we're given Shem and he's last. And the question is, why is he last? And this is just the way things worked in the Middle East. The idea is this is the most important person. So we waited to the end to tell you about the most important person. And it's, it's, it's Shem's lineage. Now that's strength. 
And the reason that's strange is because Sim, it tells you, make sure you understand, he's not the older brother. And why is that important? Because basically, your prosperity was your, your, your firstborn son. So your firstborn son was the future. All the other kids, they were just exactly, you know, uh, they were important, I guess. The way that we look at it here, by the way, is we say uh, two kids, right? Two, two kids, and then uh, the, 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 the king and queen are free to do whatever they want after that. Yeah, just give us two heirs, and then we'll move on. Yeah, that's what we're saying. Well, that's what happens here. The firstborn is important. That's it. Your firstborn is your future. All the other kids, who cares about them whatsoever? And yet, God says, no, Shem is the most important. And why does he do that? And the answer is, Shem has the faith. And we can look back in the previous chapter. Yafet goes along with Shem, but it's Shem's idea to honor his father. And that kernel of faith, God is saying, that is going to make the difference. You're going to receive the blessing. You're going to receive the blessing. Now, one of the people there is named Eber. Okay, it doesn't sound particularly... Uh, relevant to us. That person ever is the word from which we get Ivrim or Hebrews, okay? The Hebrew people. And so the, imagine now you're in the wilderness. Moses gives you this amazing book. Here's this amazing book from God called Genesis, but a sheet. It tells you where you're coming from and where you're going. And then you read about a person who's named Hebrew and you're like, wait, I'm Hebrew. <laughs> and then what you realize is, ah, I'm of the line of faith. And I am being invited into the opportunity to have the same sort of faith that Shem and Eber had. And if I will do so, then I will have this land of these people who don't have faith. And God will bless me. And so this is all point. This is all for them. And God is saying to them, listen, continue to have faith in me. And look, I've already divided the world, but I scattered the people who wouldn't listen. And I will give you the blessing. And he will give us too the blessing as well. Now from Eber comes Abraham. And from Abraham comes David. And from David comes Jesus. This is the line of faith. God, how can you contribute? You know, guess what? You guys were not necessarily born into the Shemite line. A few of us in here are born from the Shemite line. Fine but you can be part of the Shemite line. All you have to do is have faith. <laughs> That's the idea. Everyone gets grace in place, but only those with faith get the blessing. I want to leave you with this image. It's the perpetually unthankful child. Okay, so many of you have children, and you know that the child does not really understand all the graces of which they have been graced, okay? <laughs> you change children when they're tiny, they get older, you feed them, and you give them nice things, and you take care of them, and you spend lots of time with them. And for all of this, they have no recognition necessarily that this is special at all. They just consume it. <laughs> and they get really upset on occasion over things that you think, goodness, have you not seen all that I have done for you? Now, listen, that's fine for a child. But God is asking us to grow up. Everything that you have is a gift. Everything that you have, the breath you breathe is a gift, a gift that you did not demand of God, the gift that he had no, he had, he had no necessity to require to give you. He gives you food, he gives you place, he gives you grace. And then oh, more than all of that, he sends himself in the form of Jesus to die the death that you deserve so that you can have life. All of that is yours. And the question is, are you going to be the unthankful child that never grows up? Or are you going to say, I will let this turn into gratitude? I will let this great gift change who I am. I will speak to my maker. I will look to the Lord. And I will love him for he has loved me. Mature people are people who realize the great gifts of God and apply it into their life day by day. And they receive it and they let it change them. That's what I'm hoping that we'll be people who will acknowledge the gift and the grace of God. And that will totally change how we look.
and will change us and we will be the seed of faith. Let's pray.